interesting data for you that I might have appreciated Rick's amazing photography longer than anyone in this, in this audience. That's because Rick and I went to school together, college, Dickinson College. I saw his remarkable photographs in the paper all the time. So it's great to have Rick here. And uh, in 2013, the Pelley Center's International Council hosted a conference called the Data Overthrow concerning the increasing access to global information and how it's transformed our media world. Rick was one of our featured speakers presenting insights from his acclaimed book on big data. We're, great, we're great, uh, grateful to Rick that he wanted to premiere his new documentary here on this screen. Rick and his team are true visionaries, illuminating for us how the gathering and analyzing of data is suddenly allowing us to address some of our biggest problems from world hunger to health to pollution. We also want to preserve this important documentary in our collection. We have over 150,000 radio and television programs here where we look at how media has informed public discussion about the world's most pressing programs. So we're really pleased that Rick will donate the program to us. Now it's my pleasure to introduce, to get this evening started, David Yonker, who is Senior Director of SAP's Big Data Initiative, the supporting sponsor of tonight's film. He drives the go-to-market and co-innovation initiatives across SAT, SAP's Big Data Solutions. David's career also includes 10 years on software, on software engineering. Please welcome David Yonker. Good evening. I'm so glad you guys could all make it tonight. Yeah, for the New York premiere of The Human Face of Big Data. It's a beautiful film. It's a very important topic in my mind. Um, big data or the data revolution has the potential to really change our world in, in amazing ways. Um, to take on some of the greatest challenges that our world is facing. But it's not all opportunity, there is, or promise, I should say, it's not all promise, there is peril as the film uh, uh, talks about. But the opportunity, the opportunity is, is huge. <clears throat> oh, just over a year ago, uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon stated, the data revolution is giving the world powerful tools that can help usher in a more sustainable future. And I couldn't agree more. <clears throat> One of the biggest opportunities we have for big data or the data revolution is related to the sustainable development goals that were just ratified by the UN member states this past weekend. I don't know how many of you know about them. There's 17 goals. They build on the Millennium Development Goals. And, uh, and they're, they're taking on some of the greatest challenges that our world's facing. Everything from uh, poverty, uh, eliminating poverty, people living in extreme poverty, to um, a climate change and protecting our water, protecting our cities, ensuring equality for all. So they're, they're very far-reaching reaching, uh, goals. But there's a challenge. Most of that data doesn't actually exist within uh, statistical systems that governments host. Right? Most of the data is actually embedded into data centers, websites, smartphones, and increasingly things. And, um, and it's not controlled by one government, nor one institution, nor is it universally accessible. Right? Some people have data, some people need data. Recognizing the challenge, an advisory group to Ban Ki-moon recommended the formation of a multi-stakeholder partnership. It's a par partnership that brings together uh, governments from around the world, uh, brings together statistical offices, brings together uh, NGOs, civic society, private sector. And their whole mission is to harness the data revolution to help monitor and achieve the sustainable development goals. That partnership's called the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. It actually uh, launched yesterday. Uh, the political launch was yesterday. Uh, and SAP's proud to be a, a founding member and an anchor partner for that. And uh, we're proud to be hosting this evening with, uh, uh, in association with uh, the, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. The challenge, so, so actually, great success. We've launched with about 70 partners uh, for this global partnership. But to be very successful, to address some of these greatest challenges, what we really need to do is we need to grow the number of partners participating. And that requires people understanding what the data revolution is all about. Something that the film does an incredibly good job of. I remember um, when uh, Rick approached us uh, a number, a while back, asking if we wanted to sponsor the creation of the film. At SAP, we were trying to, uh, we were grappling with how to change the conversation with our customers. 
Okay? So, so we spent a lot of time talking about big data with our customers as if it was a technical challenge. Right? It was all about technology. When in reality, what we wanted to do is we wanted to talk about the opportunity that big data presented. Uh, to talk about some of the social issues and, uh, and really bring IT and business together okay, into, uh, into the conversation. It's not just a, an IT conversation, it's not just a business conversation, it's a conversation that requires both groups to come together in a very real way uh, if, if change is going to happen. I was blown away when I first saw the Human Face Big Data book. I don't know if any of you have seen it. If you haven't, I, I highly recommend you go get one. Uh, it's an amazing book. Rick does a fantastic job of making this topic, big data, very relatable. And, and Sandy does an equally, equally amazing job of actually uh, creating aha moments with the film. And it's those aha moments that, um, that was inspiring SAP to say, you know what, we, we want to, uh, to, uh, to bring these aha moments to many other people. In fact, SAP is committing to hosting 100 screenings of the film in at least 10 different languages around the world um, to, to, to be able to create those aha moments. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's been a personal joy of mine to work with Sandy and Rick and their teams as we, we roll out this film. Uh, I am truly amazed at their storytelling uh, abilities. Uh, it's a real gift. Hard to believe it's two brothers. Well, maybe it's not hard to believe. Two brothers, you know, both with the same gift. And it makes me wonder which of their family members they, they actually got that from. <laughs> but um, it, it's been a, uh, a joy uh, for me watching the film. I've, I've seen it numerous times. Each time I take away some insight from the film. And I trust you will as well as you watch the film and uh, followed by the panel discussion. Thank you. I think that was quite an experience, Rick, and, and the team, you really did a wonderful job. And we've arranged for a, a brief panel discussion for a little bit of time, where we're also going to involve the audience. I'm Jay Walker, and I'm uh, the curator of TED Med, and I'm the moderator of this evening's panel. Um, and we're going to start off really by just having everybody introduce them themselves, just for one or two sentences, who you are and sort of how you connect to this film. So uh, I'm Rick Smolin, and I, I think I have the best job in the world. I'm sure everybody else feels the same way, but about every 18 months, um, my wife Jennifer Irwin and I get to send um, hundreds of our peers and friends and journalists around the world on sort of Mission Impossible assignments to look at emerging technologies, and this was sort of our, our new look at something we think is going to affect every single person on the planet. I'm Jake Porway. I'm the uh, founder and executive director of a nonprofit called DataKind. Uh, and we use big data in the service of humanity. So it is a huge honor to be here amongst uh, Rick and the team because we believe so strongly in the mission that this movie espouses, which is that this is sort of a new age in which uh, the same algorithms that businesses are using to boost profits can instead actually be expanded to help social organizations and humanity boost its understanding and boost its impact. Good evening to you. My name is Irvin Khan. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of SAP, uh, one of the sponsors and uh, the underwriters of this movie, and it's been a tremendous opportunity, first and foremost, for me to, to view the movie with all you this evening. Uh, my role at SAP is to really be one of the, the players, the actors, if you like, within the assembly of this technology that we have around us, and trying to make sense of all of the information, all the way through from the way that we'll ingest it, the way we store the information, the processing side of things, and probably the most important part in terms of how we will look to visualize this information. So I look forward to perhaps engaging with some of you this evening. I'm Sandy Smullen, I directed the movie. Um, I come from a very creative family, and along with my brother Rick and my sister Leslie is here. We tend to work on each other's projects, and uh, Rick had help, has helped me on mine, and Leslie's designed for us, and Rick came to me, and uh, we talked about the idea of taking the book and seeing if there was a way to turn it into a film. Um, I've done features, I've done lots of television. I think this is probably the most difficult project I've ever done. <laughs> Trying to take a lot of data, a lot of information, and synthesize it into uh, an hour, was incredibly challenging. Probably more sleepless nights than I've ever had on any other project. Um, but, but thrilling also, because it was really a window into our future as a species. I um, just want to make a couple introductions. Um, we have some of the crew here tonight, but I'd love to introduce um, my editor, Dan Overall, who did an amazing job. And our longtime collaborator uh, and cinematographer, Yatsi Blaskis, who did a 
acquisition partner, Bill Metzger. There are two people from the film here. Stephen Downs, are you with us? Laura Kurgan, Laura, are you with us? Hey, Laura. we start, since almost everybody in the theater, I'm hoping, had seen the movie for the first time, there's sort of a first reaction that everybody gets when they see something for the first time, as opposed to the thousand <laughs> times. So, Urban, this was the first time you had seen the film. So, if you had to sort of take a takeaway in one or two or three sentences, what did you take from that? <laughs> That's the first impression I'll give you. Uh, it's actually quite incredible. I mean, as technologists, we sort of sit behind the scenes and we try to come up with innovative ways of, of making sense of all of the information that we generate. So my first takeaway really was it's a huge investment that's going on in around information and data. I mean, some statistics that come to mind, I mean, Google, which was, of course, one of the, uh, the contributors in this, in 2014, in Q2, in fact, they spent an estimated $2.35 billion on data center-related expenses. And this is just the amount of money that they're plung in, you know, plunging into being able to set up the data center so we can start storing information and managing information. And in that same era, Amazon and Microsoft in similar you know, numbers spent 1.8 billion and 800 million. So we're seeing huge investments. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's almost like saying when we buy a house, we have to buy furniture. And the permission to play in our industry is we need to have the infrastructure, the underlying data structures, or data centers rather, to be able to store this information. So maybe that's on the technology side. What's on the, on the really on the inspirational side is so many different verdicts can be drawn from, from what we saw. I mean, if you look at the, the notion of being able to map out the human genome, I mean, statistics once again, I mean, if I was to draw a line down this audience here, 50% of the people in this room at some point in their time are going to unfortunately be dealt with the bad news of getting cancer in their lifetime. And if we have that, that unfortunate situation arise, how quickly are we going to find ourselves being treated? And that being able to map out the human genome as was described, the fact is that 20 to 25,000 human genes are essentially made up in our, in our person. And there's more than 6 billion nucleotides that make up our identity. Now, if we map across the complexity of all of these different numbers, what we recognize is that we are only individuals mapped to a genome, which is only a sample of the, of the population. But yet, as one of seven billion people on this planet, I'm unique, as I'm sure every one of you are here, unless you're a, an identical twin. So we have to understand that there is so much more that we need to do. And for me, the, the real key takeaway from the movie really is, is, wow, isn't it just incredible how information is being stored and how much investment is being made, but ultimately how little we know about ourselves so far. So every movie is a story. If you were to tell us the story of this movie in two or three sentences, what's the essence of the story? Well, I think we're seeing something that our species has never seen before. I mean, whenever you hear about technology, you think, oh, this is another iterative layer on top of something we've seen before. Um, there's a great quote from Eric Schmidt that opens the book, and Eric says that from the dawn of humanity to 2003, the human race generated five exabytes of data. Now, even if you don't know what an exabyte is, the fact that we're now generating five exabytes every two days, it's a straight vertical line. The cost of actually measuring the planet. We're all walking around with sensors in our pockets now. We've all become human sensors. So the fact that we're actually developing the tools, just as we're creating all these problems, is, as John Mattel said, suddenly, just at that time, we're suddenly the dawn of a new age. hopefully inventing this new is tools. The, this right? is the dawn of a new age. John, yeah, well, that's one of the takeaways in doing all these interviews was what people keep saying is this is just the beginning. We, we're learning how, as much as we think we know, we're learning how little we know, and that we're in the dawn of this new era of knowledge. Yeah, this is the but suddenly, era. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then we will look back now. Um, this is where we started to get a little bit, but we know that this whole world has opened up in front of us. So we've seen dawns of ages before in human history, and this appears to be just another age of human history? Is that I what? I don't think just another. I, I don't think we've ever seen this before. The fact that we are on the verge of being able to re-engineer our own species, this idea of man and machine, that we're augmenting ourselves, that this idea, the separation between person and device is now starting to blur. So we're living at a time unlike any in history. And the potential of that time is not just in our ability to technology and re-engineer, but is also in our ability to provide relationship support? 
Yeah, and I would say uh, what this movie hit on at the end was the sort of social good side of this. Because really, what I think this movie did best was explain really what this new age is that's happening. Because I think when people hear data, one of the biggest challenges we have at data kind is they go, oh, spreadsheets, math, high school, stats, this is horrible. No one wants to touch it, right? But what I think this really illustrates is, you know, data is us. Data is coming off of everything we do. And that unlocks huge potential to learn about our world and about ourselves. And I think one of the uh, things that's really critical to notice is that, you know, for all of the wonderful ways we're instrumenting our, our, you know, our bodies and our heartbeats and what tugs at our heartstrings, as a species, we've gotten so good at using that data to sell people stuff. You know, Amazon can predict what you want to buy, Target wants that, and, and, and that seems like such a narrow slice of the potential of what we can do with all this work, which I think is so important that you guys hit on the end, is that's really where it is a huge opportunity to do more in this new age. You know, I'd love to hear, uh, with well, a raise a hand in a second, with somebody who also tells me what they saw. Let me tell you what I think I saw. I saw you talk about a new way to see that we're blind, that we're actually blind as a species, we actually can't see. And once you can open your eyes, you can see what before was completely invisible. And whether that was what people were doing far away, whether that was what was going on in my body, whether that was what was going on in the baby's body, it's literally as if we've all been blind, and now suddenly we have sight. And of course, if anybody's ever seen a blind person who's been restored to any level of sight, that transition is, is an unimaginable transition if you've never been blind, but it looks like we're about to be able to see for the first time as a species. I was going to say, Jay, in the movie, you, you mentioned that data was like a microscope. It reminded me of a, a great piece I was going to throw around um, by this guy, Joel Rosnay, in 1979, talked about something he called the macroscope. Mm -hmm. You know, and said, right. that, yeah, the, the, we invented this telescope to see the infinitely great, and then the microscope to see the infin infinitely small. But that data could be this kind of macroscope that could see the infinitely complex. And so and, I agree more. And it's not just seeing what we're doing, but it's also government seeing what we're up to. It's we're seeing what each other is up to. I'd love if anybody would like to raise a hand and say, what did you see in this movie? Or what was unique in the movie that struck you right in the center? No, uh, it's more what I thought. We're going to pass your microphone. We're going to pass your microphone, too. It's more what I thought in seeing the film, and I'd just like you to talk about the concept of crowd mapping and the old-fashioned idea of privacy and where big data uh, and the positive interventions which are shown in the film as opposed to NSA, etc., but still, where does, is privacy gone, and is, if it's gone, is that a good or bad thing? Well, I think privacy is the ability not to be seen. <laughs> We'd like to not be seen, and yet we're seeing an age that looks like we're going to see everything. And we have to accept that, that our notion that we all grew up in, that notion of privacy has changed, has gone away. And I think the next generation coming up is going to grow up not expecting what we've expected in the past. Yeah, you know, it's really that, this is an inevitable, it's an inevitable outcome. I was thinking the other day that if someone 10 years ago had walked up to you and said, would you mind if I planted a little sensor on you that would tell me <laughs> who you're talking to, what you're spending money on, what books you've read, who you've met with, Basically, everything about you, would you let me put this little sensor on? You would have said, oh, are you kidding me? And now people will sleep in front of the Apple store for three days. <laughs> to pay $800 to put the sensor well, on they, themselves. They, <laughs> because it's giving us all these... 40% of people right? check their cell phone before they get out of bed in the West. Forty Before they get out of bed, and I know you're in this. <laughs> so, it's not even just what we see, but it's what we hear. Because now with Siri and the equivalent, the phone is always listening to you. Always listening to you. Well, and I think that's very, oh sorry, I think that's very, you know, Big Brother-esque, but I think it's, it shows up in more subtle ways. Um, someone recently looked at all of the New York City fleet data of all the taxi cabs. Totally anonymized. You don't know whose names they are, who the cab drivers are. But they matched that up with publicly available data of mosque locations. And if you look at the times that the drivers go to these various areas, you can very accurately pinpoint who's Muslim. Now, the, the point there is that these data sets themselves don't reveal that, but together give you personal insight. So I very much agree that this notion, that the traditional notion of privacy is absolutely gone, given you can instrument everything about each other to understand who everyone is. The question is now, what do we want to do with that? How do we uphold our values? Let's not treat it as necessarily scary, and, and let's turn it off, because I think that genie is out of the bottle, but how do we now use that to uphold the values of the I think that there's a... 
genuine age of innocence issue here, right? So when we were growing up, perhaps the majority of people, of course, there's a lot of millennials in the room as well, we sort of resigned ourselves to the fact that we would have information stored about us, but it was typically in filing cabinets. And somebody would have a lock, and they would typically unlock it and show you something. And now, of course, the, the notion is that information is, of course, you know, it, it's around us. We have a data footprint that is essentially growing day by day. And, of course, there is no notion of the undelete or the undo on the internet. So I think the youth of today have some, some learnings, right? So what you say and what you don't say and what you believe in later years may be used against you or for you. It just depends. And I think the notion that we always have to understand now is with data privacy, there is, of course, the notion of data ethics. And this is perhaps something that will be maybe more rooted into academia. And as we go through prep school and academic education in itself will perhaps be augmented. So people understand what does it really mean to have privacy at the core of what we do, and how do we preserve, people, like, preserve people's identities. So I think that the notion of strong data ethics is something that will ferment over time, and each and every one of us will either have to have an opt-in or opt-out policy in our mind. Just as in the United Kingdom today, if you're unfortunate to have a road traffic accident, and at the same time, you're, you know, if, if you have a family member that was involved in a fatal accident, you know, you have to now opt out to not be a kidney donor or a transplant donor of, of sort. So the driving application of today, the DMV equivalent in the United Kingdom, is actually actively encouraging people to opt out if they don't want to be part of this community. So I think this is a behavioural change. And privacy in, itself, privacy in itself would certainly be brought into question. I'd like to come back to the movie for a second. Given the fact that I think you guys represented very well the ennobling side of Big David, the possibilities and the fear side. I'm curious as to the audience with a show of hands, I'm going to ask you whether or not you took from the movie more of a sense of optimism about what Big Data might be able to do to make the world a better place and your life a better place versus a sense of concern or fear, I won't say dread, it didn't have that element, but there certainly was plenty of things to be concerned about. So those are the two choices you have, all right? Uh, it's, are you, did you come away more optimistic or a little bit more concerned than before the movie? So let's start with a show of hands, more optimistic. This is a New York crowd. It's a tough crowd. Okay, down, and more concerned. So it's, my data is about three to one for optimism. Okay, three to four to one for optimism. And that's sort of very different than I suspect we would find in mainstream America. So what is it about this film that brought out in a tough New York crowd a sense that, you know what, we've got a lot to be encouraged about. Now, I didn't slice the data by age and a lot of other things that would probably reveal a much deeper set of meanings, but I took the aggregate data. So what is it about this movie that, Rick, that you think brings out optimism? Well, you know, having been a journalist for many years, um, there's a tendency... Professional of, cynic, is that? Well, <laughs> no, but there's a tendency if it bleeds, it bleeds. You know, if you can have a big, scary headline, people will buy your magazine or your book because we all want to protect ourselves. And I think telling a story that's positive is a little more challenging. Um, I think... It, I want to give... Can I share one personal story? So, my mom is in her 90s, and uh, my dad died about seven years ago. And she insisted on living alone in Florida. And uh, she started falling. So she fell. She was a little bit bruised the second time. She, we, we kept trying to tell her we should move in with us, but she wouldn't. And so we hired these women to live with her who slept on her couch. And, you know, it was like, they're stealing my garbage bags. I did ask her your garbage bags. So, you know, I was desperately looking for, you know, we were, my brother and my sister and I were all looking for something to help mom because she insisted on being independent. So I found out that General Electric and Intel were working on a product called the Magic Carpet. It was a carpet that you could install in the home of your loved one. And for the first week, it would create a pattern and say, this is the baseline for Rick and Leslie and Sandy's mom. This is what's normal. A carpet and, that knows. Okay. And two days before she fell, it would somehow, it would look at muscle weakness, it would look at her pattern and say, there's something different in the pattern. Now this carpet, they never released it, it was going to be $30,000, but now with the Apple Watch and the Fitbit and the Jawbone, the, the, the gamification of health was so not just for old, sick, or infirm people. The fact that Sandy and I can see who did our 10,000 steps yesterday, he lives in LA, and this idea of measuring yourself all the time, not in a, you know, I, I think some people think of this as a self-absorbed to be, to be, you know, navel gazing, but this idea of wearing a device that tells you there's something different in your pattern. I mean, you run 10 men, you see all of these 
amazing advances in medicine where instead of going to the doctor when you're feeling really bad, all these devices may give us this early indication that something is amiss and we deal with the medical things you know, early on rather than later. You know, I'm curious, uh, one of the people who came away more optimistic, you raise your hand, I'd like to know what it was from the film, right over there, if we can bring a microphone, that made you feel, wow, I'm a little more optimistic than I might have. Okay. <laughs> Than I, than I might have before I started watching the film. Did, did we have the data from two days ago to know you'd slip? <laughs> that carpet is very smart. It was her grandmother I was talking to you about. <laughs> Um, so, one of the things I took from the film, very optimistic, is this, this idea that, that I've been convinced of for a long time, is that in, in many ways we're all the same no matter where we're from, no matter what part of the planet, and these ways of finding connectivity between people who don't even know each other, and of course we saw that, I think, probably exemplified best with respect to the story about Tunisia and people feeling empowered because they were connected to people they didn't know. Which brings up a question, back with the uh, release of the book, there was the app, the Big Data app, that allowed you to find your big data doppelganger yeah. somewhere else in the world. Uh, is there a plan now with the release of the movie to bring that back and maybe expand some of the functionality of that? Uh, no, I mean, that was sort of an experiment that we did early on. Uh, one of the things we did do, which is that there's actually an app with a book where you can point at, like there's a story about Jay in the book, for example, and you can point your smartphone or your tablet at a photograph of Jay, and just like Harry Potter, Jay turns around and talks to you and tells you his story. And it's a quite extraordinary story. And there's like 20 people in the book that will talk to you. So that's that's our new use of technology and integrating it with the book. Jay, can I ask your, your question? Which is, um, I think when you, for me, looking at this world and stepping technology, you see, you can't help but look at the power of technology and, and the, the power that it has to really change our lives. And it's a, and it, but it, it is power that we have a choice what we do with it. And I think we are at a kind of turning point. Do we want to use it in a good way? Um, you know, I think the engine of change right now is coming from these amazing technological changes that are happening. But what are we going to do with them? And are we going to use them for something small like shopping? Or are we going to use them for something big? But the tool is there. And I think that was the intent of the film was to show that we have the, we're at this turning point where we're like, we can use this if we choose to. Yeah, and though there's a real interesting question of who is the we. Right? Because once you have millions or billions of people who each can define what they want to do, suddenly government policies are a whole lot tougher to implement. You know, privacy? Well, you can de-identify pretty much any data you want in a matter of seconds, depending on, you know, a little bit of access to external data. So I, I'm suspicious that policy is really going to do a whole lot for us, even though I'd love for policy yeah. to do it. Uh, you have a global perspective. Do you see policy being a driver in our ability to use data responsibly, or is it going to be something we're going to sort of bump and stumble along? I think policy is one of those things where politicians, by definition, are always looking for the popular vote. And with the notion of crowdsourcing and, and the whole scale movement that we see now in terms of campaigns that are run on shoestring budgets in the United Kingdom, for example, we don't have a huge investment portfolio that goes behind each candidate. I mean, in fact, I think there's a when David Cameron ran for, uh, for, for Prime Minister, he only had £150,000 that he could spend in his total campaign, which uh, is somewhat different to the, the US policies here. <laughs> so policy makers are, are able to at least influence to a point, but I think the, the propaganda machine that used to be used by a lot of policy makers in the past has kind of been rendered useless now. Because just if you look at the Arab Spring, you take a look at all of these massive cultural events that have gone on over the last probably three to five years, it's actually the citizens that are actually in empowerment. And it's not the policy makers per se. Policy makers actually catch up retrospectively afterwards in many ways. Because whereas the past takes out the Arabia as an example, should women be able to drive? Okay. I mean, popularity wise in the past, I mean, because of the clerics of the nation, they will say no. But now, of course, there's an entire generation coming up that all want to drive, right? So therefore, policy is somewhat changing. And that's a very conservative regime in that country, and there's many regimes in the world. So I think policy is definitely being influenced by data, and the citizen is in the driving seat of that. So why don't we bring the microphone to the woman up here who's got a question. And while we do, I'll, have, I'll ask one more question. Certainly one of the more uplifting things is the kind of thing you are doing specifically with data. Can you give us one story where big data from a large organization to an NGO or to a nonprofit really changed the game? And then we'll go to this question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we did a project uh, not that long ago with a group called Give Directly. And uh, Give Directly gives cash transfers directly to the poorest. They don't work through a bank. They say you can just give money to people who are poor and they can know what to do with it. 
And the program's been pretty successful, I'll be a little bit controversial. Um, and so they wanted to expand, and they said, you know, we'd love to go to the poorest villages in Kenya and Uganda, but you know, it's very difficult to figure out what the poverty levels actually really are on the ground. So they'd send people out on foot to do a household survey. And look at the roof types of each uh, uh, building and say, if it's a thatched roof, that's a little bit lower income level, and so they can invest in an iron. So it's a great way of getting sort of a survey of the income levels, but, you know, take people to go out and walk around entire countries, it take a huge amount of time and effort. So uh, we teamed them up with some data scientists from IBM uh, and we said, you know, you could probably figure that out just by looking at Google Maps satellite imagery. You can Google see Maps. The, yeah, you can see the roofs, uh, you can see the roof types, and you write an algorithm that goes through, processes all the images, and now you can get that same estimate in about two hours, click on a button, no one need to go out. Now there's a, a bit of tweaks still needed for that algorithm, but I think that really points to the promise of not just the data that individuals are collecting, but the ways that data that companies have aligned with people that have a social mission, aligned with the technologists that know what to do with it, can really be used to bring about uh, more effective social change. It's really interesting. So satellites 300 miles in the sky taking pictures of roofs, figure out where the poorest people live, so you can have donors who then directly transfer money onto their cell phones that they can use to buy food. Do I have that right? You do, and I, I'm underlying that is ethical, a lot of ethical questions involved right. in that. But that's, that's not a problem we're used to. Yes? I, I thought that I was very grateful that the film mostly um, promoted the use of the word data rather than data, which is <laughs> it was very exciting to me. But I, I think that... <laughs> I think that the film is um, a little bit uh, overly optimistic in not recognizing the vast possibility of corruption and taint, which of course pervades. We don't know where six billion dollars went under some of these uh, um, administrations. And, and Snowden, although I don't regard him as a good guy, Snowden did tell us how much of our lives are revealed too much of the time. And I'm looking at the Danish writer who wrote The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, where she was off the grid. And I've traveled in the West, where people want to be off the grid. I, in New York City, go to a doctor who writes everything down and puts it in her cabinet so that the government doesn't know about me. I don't want them to know about me. And this doesn't pay attention to the fact that maybe we don't want to be one node in six billion little other nodes of everybody knowing everything about me. I don't want that. So clearly there is, I mean, and I think that's what we talked about earlier, there's this privacy element where I don't want people to see me. And we've lived in a culture, especially in the West, where we've assumed that we had that right. But now with satellites seeing my roof, and every purchase I made at the pharmacy being perfectly tracked regardless what's in your doctor's compartment, all that pharmacy data, all of your insurance submission forms, um, if you don't do any of it, but most people can't afford to be off that system. Um, and most people will find themselves at some point needing pharmace pharmaceuticals will be on the grid. So how do we, or can we, and the arguments that you guys have made have said, that's just not going to be practical going forward. I think, firstly, by the way, I also agree the word is data, not data. <laughs> and also, I mean, if you really look at the, the foundations of how we've evolved as, as a species, right, we tend to have more association with quality of information and data as opposed to quantity. And a good example of this is if you look at India as an example, right, so ancestral land is passed through generation to generation. And in large villages, they tend to have a scroll. It's an uninterrupted scroll. And it literally would have the lineage of the handing down of land from, from family member to family member. You can't cut it. You can't paste it together. It's just, it is that. It's a physical embodiment of what actually transpired. The bigger challenge that we have today is quality of data, right? So it's not as, even as much as the privacy or the malicious intent around data. Just because of the virtue and the, the way that we manage information today, comes in and creeps in the notion of data quality and data cleansing. How do we clean this data? And this is one of the fundamentals, and, and, and Jay and I were talking about this in, in, the, uh, in the reception prior to this. We have to put a disproportional investment in, in terms of not just technology, but also in the acumen around the quality of that information. Because without that, all we're going to run into is lots of bad decisions very quickly, which are going to be more negative and, and perhaps even more you know, impactful to us in a negative way than we would have liked. I also think that there ought to be a data bill of rights. I think that, as was referred to before, I think I think we should be able to opt into whether we want our information shared rather than having to try to opt out. There's a gentleman um, named Hugo Campos who had a uh, pacemaker installed 
And Hugo keeps track of his exercise, his sleep, his diet, his alcohol consumption. So he called the maker, the, pa the maker of this pacemaker, and said, I'd like six months of the data that my pacemaker's been generating so I can actually try to cross tabulate it and see are certain things I'm doing making my pacemaker kick in. And there's this long pause on the phone where he says, well, I'm sorry, sir, that, that's our proprietary data. And he said, what are you talking about? It's my heart. I want to copy it. I generated the data. So the question is, who does own this data? And who's profiting from it? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm willing to let people share it. Um, but I, I mean, one of the things, one of the purposes of doing this project, one of the things we hoped for when Sandy did the movie, when we did the book, was to spark a conversation. Because right now, I think it's corporations and governments that understand the incredible power that's behind this big data revolution. I think the average person says, yeah, I'll give you this data if I get a free you know, coupon for McDonald's. I mean, people give away their data so freely without realizing how easy it is to then use that data to market to them and to sell the information about it. So there's an awakening, and we'll get it back in the room, we'll bring a mic up there. There's an awakening as in this new age that things that you never thought about that had value and importance suddenly have value and importance. And we'll need to define as societies who gets that value and who controls that importance. And without that, we're going to have ourselves a disaster or two before we change our minds back. Jeff, also it's about access to knowledge. One of the things that we talk about in the film and you talk about is that basically there's now access to knowledge in a way that's never been possible before. And who uses that knowledge? Um, we had a screening a couple months ago um, with a group of students and a young girl who was 22 got up and said, everybody in my generation needs to see this film because this is our future in some ways. For all of us in this room, it's past. Right. We're, we're going to see the end of. We're going to see the beginning of this change. But it's the next generation of students that are really going to make those decisions. All right, we have a person in the back. Uh, yes, uh, I guess as I listen to the questions that are coming up, the question in my mind is really: there's, there's no question that data will is accelerating the change, the slope of the curve dramatically in terms of every aspect of our lives. My question is, to what extent can the institutional structures by which we live adapt uh, along the way? Government, the whole employment world, corporations, etc., the educational systems. Because those things don't change very quickly. And, you know, if you think about this whole data question, it's just largely, the slope of the curve changed dramatically in the last, over the last 15 years. This isn't really a 50-year phenomenon. This is a 10 and 15, and it's, it's uh, sloping. You know, whatever the stat was given earlier about you know what happens in two days, and as we watch government, we watch our education systems, we even watch our corporate employment systems. They don't change very quickly. Well, I think that was a point earlier. I think that you made, which is none of our institutions were ever evolved to deal with this level of rapid change. None of them were evolved to do that. And since institutions are the product of an evolutionary process, whether it's government, corporations, uh, you know, uh, NGOs, you know, the United Nations, you pick it, then none of them evolved in a rapid data-changing environment world. So I think what we can expect is none of them will be ready for these changes. So the only question is next is what happens when no institutions are, re are, are ready for a massive change in the world that we live in? And of course, we have no answer. A great example is employment. Yeah, jobs are a question. You know, what happens in a world of jobs? As Sandy has heard me say, there was a Wall Street Journal article about four months ago. Big headline, data, the next middle manager. Grab the mic. Uh, four months ago or so, Wall Street Journal headline, Data, the Next Middle Management. And really what it was talking about is you know, the bulk of middle management of corporate America disappearing as a result of data and analytics. Well, in 1900, most Americans lived on a farm. And for a period of 60 years, the nation industrialized. And it took quite a while as we moved off farms and we had chances for our institutions to catch up to the manufacturing and industrial revolution. But if we have that same change in 10 or 15 years, how would we deal with it? Jay, can I jump in here about something that I think relates to institutional change and this question of data that I think we're not talking about, which is the institutions of expertise. Uh, we act as if all this data means we're all able to do stuff, but how many people here can run MapReduce? 
Yeah, or know what words I just said. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we're awesome. Do it for the rest of us. Great. So that's you know one of the key algorithms for processing huge amounts of data. And I think if we don't acknowledge that there's sort of a, a, an analogy almost in early days of literacy, I think, that's going on right now, where in the old days, uh, only the monks could read and write. You know, you had to go to the monks in the church to figure out what, what could be read or, or written. And that was very much locked up there. Um, but people often point to the printing press as allowing that democratization of reading and writing, because now you can print the print the printed word, but I know I can read. Exactly. We're missing that middle layer, the literacy. And I think that's the age we're in now, where you've got data everywhere. We've got the printing press. All of you can download the census or all of Google's data, but unless you have a PhD in statistics and computers, what really are you going to do with it beyond that? And so we're in this kind of awkward pubescence, right? Where we're like bumping up against visualizing data uh, easily, but we're, we're missing that connection between people that are highly paid in Silicon Valley and Wall Street and those of us being affected by it. So, well, I think, yeah. one, yeah. I think yeah. by the way, there's a shortage of people that can do that. The question yeah, actually, you can enhance that data literacy. Yeah, the question is very interesting if you kind of ask the question in a different way, which is what will need to happen in order for governments? whether it's industry or whomever else, to be able to truly start capitalizing on the value of this information. Because I think perhaps vendors have done a very poor job, and you just mentioned the words map and reduce. I mean, reality is that there's so much data FUD that goes on out there. In fact, even in the first era of big data was talking about information Armageddon is coming. And there's no way that you can avoid it. You're going to get almost taken out with the, with the lack of information and insight that you'll be able to, to be able to garner. In most institutions today, most organizations today, there is really no rationalization of how to value information and data. In fact, we can borrow something from the airline industry. If you look at the way passengers are, are essentially you know, ferreted through the systems, right? You have economy, business class, maybe first class passengers. And the airlines you know, put a disproportionate investment in managing first class passengers because they bring in the, the biggest revenue. And economy class passengers individually don't really amount to much. But if you look at them as an aggregate, that's a hefty, hefty sort of population that they have to manage. And it just kind of turns around the way that we look at data. We have lots of economy class data, all of these, you know, maybe these acknowledgements that come from your cell phone every time you go past a specific location, that's economy class data. But what does it mean in isolation? Not an awful lot. But when you map it across the whole spectrum of activities that we perform, it has a lot of value. So I think that the policy makers today are now beginning to create budgets, and the budget fiscal shortfalls in the past where they were looking for optimizations then we'll start redirecting that, that funding to you know, trying to optimize in the, if you like, the street planning, the smart cities, the smart towns, etc. And whether it's refuge collection, whether it's the, your you know, a whole host of services, public services that are currently underfunded and essentially never going to be funded to the right level, data can play a very big part in actually being able to orchestrate that. So to wind up our panel here, I'd like to have each of our panelists do one thing. I'd like you to sort of project yourself five to ten years in the future. And I'd like you to tell us one thing that we don't expect that the big data revolution is going to touch us in a way that we don't yet expect. Start at the end. <laughs> um, I think we're going to find that, that even what we're doing now in five years is going to seem like we're dinosaurs. I think the fact that we hold phones in six years, seven years, we're going to laugh. In the same way that we hold little brick phones, People look back and then you actually have to hold your phone and carry it around. Um, but I think that's going to be true across the board, that, that we're not prepared for how fast these changes are going to come and it really impact every part so of So the life. primary on-ramp to the network will, come, will, will move from this brick of a device to somewhere else, either we'll wear it, embed it in our clothes, Absolutely. in our bodies, but it's not going to be a thing like a phone. Separate from us, no, no more. I think that's fine. I think the notion of being able to do much more predictive uh, analytics and insight is going to be that much more impactful. Everything from in our personal lives, if we're affected by crime, the propensity to be affected by crime, the notion of healthcare, the ability for us to have a stable financial you know, foundation for our families, we'll be able to use the information that we gather personally around ourselves and our families to be much more empowered to make those kind of decisions. Whereas today, it's merely somebody else is making decisions on our part, but not really joining up the dots in the way that we would like them to. You know, the way that DataKind works is we connect data scientists who want to donate back pro bono with organizations, kind of like Doctors Without Borders for Data Geeks. I expect in five years we won't have to see that so much because we're going to enhance that data literacy to the point that everyone is not just using data, that everyone on the globe is becoming scientists. 
And I hope that as we see, that really will be everyone on the globe, because I'd be remiss if I didn't mention I did some data collection of my own during the movie, and of the people speaking, you know, it was about uh, 25 men and five women, mostly American, and that's great. And it was easy to solve that problem, right? But, you know, I think what you'll see in the future is, of course, talk to people like Anoush from the UN Global Pulse here about what we're seeing in Jakarta, of people changing things, or the, the tech re revolution in Nairobi, and really not just they've got data like their nodes for us to see what they're doing, or them, as Tim O'Reilly was saying at the end, to become scientists as well. So I think we'll look back at this as, as silly that we ever had it so separated. This is going to sound like a strange answer, but um, how many of you have gone to restaurants recently where you watch couples and they're doing this yes. the entire time and with everybody in the world except the person they're sitting with? Um, there's a scene in Her, that wonderful movie with Joaquin Phoenix and Scarlett Johansson where he's sitting on some steps and everybody walking up out of these, this underground is doing the same thing. Um, there was a guy at TED this year that gave this wonderful talk, which I think of as Mr. Potato Head, he said he's working with people who are blind and deaf, and he's found he's got he's working on the ability to take uh, uh, um, sound and, uh, and and vision and turn it into the data that then communicates with the part of your brain that that translates. I mean, if you think about it, our eyes are translating everything in this room into data and putting it into the part of our brain that then maps it. So he said, first of all, they're having a lot of success giving hearing and sight back to people that are blind and deaf, but he said. Well, I can give people the ability to hear the way a dog hears, or to see an infrared. Like, why stop there? Is I can. We, um, he said, imagine an airplane where I can feed every instrument into your brain. So instead of pushing switches, you are literally controlling thousands of different devices at once. I think this is where this is all going. It's way out there. An entirely new neural interface yes. for a data world that, in the past, had been constrained by our physical, a physical being suddenly is unconstrained in the same way that a radio or a television allows us to access invisible you know, electromagnetic waves to see television shows and hear radio shows that without the machine you can't hear or see. I mean, the question is, are we watching our planet evolve into a brain? I mean, some of the visuals there, you saw it looked like a computer chip and then you saw uh, a city and, the, and, the, and you can't help but think maybe this is the way that evolution works. And this is just, we're just on our way there. I don't know it's good or bad. Yeah, right. so, the one I see is the fact that the most important data in the world is the data from your skin in. And it's the data we know the least about. That baby example where, you know, we only took one heartbeat you know, measurement, we only took one respiration measurement. Well, we're walking around, we're generating about three terabytes a second in our own, in our own bodies of data. Every protein formation, every virus formation. And I think what's going to happen within five or ten years is incredibly inexpensive sensors will be inside your body everywhere and you will be able at all times to see actually what is going on in your body. So for example, today we can't diagnose cancer until it's about 100 million cells, a tumor uh, cells in the body. It takes about six or seven years before we, if we're the luckiest, we can diagnose cancer. But you have tumor fragments always flowing through your blood at all times. And there are, te you know, there are now technologies that are starting to measure every tumor fragment in your body from a single drop of blood. They can tell exactly how many cancer tumors you are growing, though most of them will never grow and kill you. So I think the black box that is the human body is going to turn white. And in five or ten years, you're going to be able to see exactly what's going on, and the world will never be the same once you know what's going on. I want to say one last thing. First of all, I want to thank SAP so much for enabling Sandy to make this wonderful film. And obviously, I want to thank Sandy for for this. I want to thank the more than 200 men and women all over the world that worked on different components of this project, the book. Um, we actually, uh, there's a little card you all hopefully picked up. If you didn't, grab on the way out. Um, SAP is making, we, we uh, we're very fortunate that the iPad app, which is a version of this book, won the Webby for Best Educational App last year. And SAP is making it free for this week all over the world, anyone who wants to download it. So if you have an iPad, I would encourage you to download it. And lastly, um, the EMC was the company that, that uh, originally funded the entire project. We're incredibly grateful to them for their help. Um, they were backed by, uh, joined by Cisco. Uh, by SIP and by FedEx, and FedEx actually delivered 60,000 copies of this book um, around the world. So we're 
incredibly grateful to them for that. And Jay and all the other panelists, uh, thank you all so much for coming today. And thank you.